Moses Nderito is a chief revenue officer at a company called Basigo. Moses is also a regular listener and a caller into this show. Good morning. Good morning, Eric. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Good to have you finally in the situation room. Thank you very much. And on the hot seat. It's not too hot. Uh, not Except the hot red lady next to me. Yes. <laughs> Bus. It's finished. <laughs> Done. <laughs> what? Where? <laughs> Everything gone. It's finished. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Moses, you're somebody who's really, really big on issues of road safety. Yes? Yeah. Uh, in fact, you even served in the board of what? The National Transport and Safety Authority. Yes. And uh, on issues of safety for bikers, for motorists, for non, for pedestrians, for everybody. What's happening on the expressway? Um, I think um, sometimes in Kenya we behave like we're the first to do something. Mm. Roads like expressways are not manned uh, by roadblocks. You put technology. Mm. There's no reason why we don't have speed cameras on that road. Mm. Uh, but again, as usual, knee-jerk reaction, now you ban matatus on the expressway. Mm. I don't understand that. What you should do is put uh, speed calming measures and uh, find people. You, you already have the database of the people using the expressway. So by the time I get to the end, if I was misbehaving, you can actually mm. apprehend me. So when you ban, uh, like they said, you ban matatus, what are you telling Kenyans? Mm. That the expressway is for the chosen few? Yes. I think it's, I think sometimes we do things like, we behave like we're the first ones to have an expressway and we are not. <laughs> then, uh, then secondly is, okay, why also must we be policed? I mean, I saw a video yesterday, somebody doing 220 on the expressway and then somebody else is filming it. Why, why, why are we doing that to ourselves? And we've always said road safety, your safety begins with you. You don't take your finger and put it in a socket. Yeah. So why do we do this to ourselves? I think we, there's, there's a tutajita nyuma hema as Kenyans. Yeah, because there's a problem. There's mm. something wrong, fundamentally wrong with us when we get on the roads. Or what, I, I don't get it. Isn't that what, isn't, you asked then why must we be policed? Isn't it because of this behavior that you're talking about filming 220 kilometers going on the expressway? Then, then that people must be policed because you're going to do rubbish like that. Yeah, but you see, I, I, I hear you, but can you actually police 50 million Kenyans mm -hmm. or how many of them? 80% of them use the roads. Mm. You can't police all of them. So we must actually get to a point whereby there's a certain personal responsibility and we must shun those people who are doing that. So that person who's sharing that video and who, then we must actually start, begin to shame them and say, this is an acceptable behavior. Mm. For example, look at what, how we rallied when the, the border border guys um, attacked that lady. The same kind of um, uh, reaction we should be getting for these people who actually... Mm ruining a national uh, highway yeah. for all of us. They are putting your life and my life at, at risk. And now they've said 80% of uh, people who take public transport can actually not be on that road mm. because one person or one, because it's, let's call it what they are, one idiot mm. did something did on something. that road. Yeah. <laughs> but is it an issue of speed or is it an issue of design or both? Hear me out. So we've seen accidents big accidents three big accidents but both at the entry and exit of the expressway we haven't seen accidents in the expressway mm. when you've seen accidents that are somewhere on the expressway it's somebody who was on the outside driving fast and missing a turn and driving into the guards into the expressway we haven't seen issues on the expressway yes there are people who are misbehaving of course mm -hmm. there are people who misbehave on thicker superhighway on the road to namanga on the People misbehave and they drive recklessly. And those ones should be identified and be dealt with. But is the issue really that people who are using the expressway are speeding? Or is it the issue of how the expressway is designed? I don't, well, I, I, would, I don't want to display ignorance because I'm, I'm not an engineer or a designer. But mm. at the end of the expressway, there's a gate, there's a toll gate. Yes. So you have to stop. Everybody now, can see that. Exactly. So mm. if, you're, if you're carrying too much speed, you need more time to stop. So if you are not carrying that speed, you would stop normally. Why haven't you crashed at the expressway? Because I don't speed. Simple. Mm -hmm. Keep your car. I mean, even if you do 80 kilometers an hour, how long is the expressway? You will still make it in less than 10 minutes. 
and you'll be within the speed limit. But I think there's an excitement of, I mean, I, it doesn't make any sense. So I wouldn't say it's a design issue because mm -hmm. then I would ask you the same question. How many people have gone through the expressway and have not crashed into the barrier at the end? You know, the, <laughs> the point that you mentioned, which is actually true, has something to do with our psyche as Kenyans and how we go about our lives. Because what you're saying is an expression of how some of the people we share the citizenry with uh, go or choose to conduct their lives. And as you say correctly, our disregard for the rule of law in many ways is manifested in perhaps ways that we would ordinarily not think of. Because as you, this, this expressway is not long, it's not 100 kilometers. Is what? 27. 27 kilometers. Precisely. So why do you want to do 200 kilometers an hour on a 27? And it isn't as though it's a thoroughfare that doesn't have stops. Mm. So the design element may play a factor into it. But again, whatever is wrong with that design may not be the design. It's the implementation of the design. Because I do not see somebody who has the wherewithal and the knowledge to be able to design an expressway and doesn't have the wherewithal to understand the connectivity of that highway with the road that existed before and how it is to cater okay. for the safety. I don't see it. Are you talking about this road that has been built? I am saying, about th I'm saying this one. Principally, I'm you know, in <laughs> this because one. this road that has been built, City, think about that uh, section. We even discussed it yesterday. Yes, we did. The entrance into the expressway at yes. Westlands. Yes. Okay. So you're coming from Oyakiwe, you get onto the overpass at ABC, so you avoid the roundabout down there, all right? You come down, you stay on the right, you find yourself in the expressway. Precisely. Okay? You were not intending to go to the expressway. There was nothing that showed you. Yes. Keep and, left. And I'm saying it's not a design problem. It's an implementation problem. Oh, because okay. I, I do it. not, uh, yes, I do not see anyone who is worth their weight in, whether it is salt or sugar, designing something of this sort and wouldn't know exactly yeah. how to ensure that everything works mm -mm. I, I don't see it so design may have been good but then the construction yes. may not have been yes i think that that specific entrance you're you're, you're talking about mm. is got a design flaw a major one mm. because and what you see is the matatus have come let's say from kangemi yep. and then they have to do a, a quick a sudden left left so that and then where do the pedestrians go so they have to stop on the side of the road to yeah. drop the pedestrians yeah. and maybe you walk across the, the other side of the road so there there is a design problem let's not let's not uh, let's not sugarcoat it mm. there is a design problem uh, and they should actually do something about it perhaps mm. the expressway should have started at abc yeah and that problem should have been sorted out as opposed to where at westlands so that when you get in at abc then the toll gate is at westlands as opposed to that uh, to that and you know exactly yeah. where you are right. exactly. or the entrance to the expressive can be earlier huh? mm. i think that there's very very many things that were not taken into consideration with the uh, design of this expressway mm. and one of those things that you mentioned then in terms of where is your pedestrian traffic going to then uh, be able to maneuver mm. Uh, how are we going to cross roads? How are we going to board public service? Because the truth of the matter is that public transport is still the highest used form of transportation in the country. Yes. Why did it not take that into consideration? Because it didn't. We cannot say, oh, maybe they did. or No, it didn't. It didn't take it into consideration and now we have these issues. But are we also saying that now seeing these two accidents, for example, that happened in the same place in as many weeks, and then unfortunately what we saw yesterday, are we saying that this can then be chalked up to the behavior of drivers on Kenyan roads? It's a it's a it's both. It's both. It's the behavior. Kenyan drivers are particularly bad. We 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 just and I, I and I feel sad that uh, I'm, I'm I'm a Kenyan and mm. I'm and I drive on these roads, but we actually are really really bad drivers. I think even maybe we should not call ourselves drivers. We know how to move cars, yeah, but we don't drive because driving you have to actually have some regard to the other person or the other road users whether they're pedestrians cyclists or other motorists mm. there's zero regard on how we drive we drive like we, there's a race to somewhere we are all going mm. and you have to get there fast and that's why we don't we don't yield um 
lights are a suggestion. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. It's chaos on our roads. You, you said something I've never heard before. Speed calming measures. Yes. What would these be? And then would they be a, a, a solution maybe to this problem? Because people have talked about speed bumps. I personally don't think it would make sense and, on the and expressway. And that's why I did, not say, I did not say speed bumps. Yeah. I said speed calming so measures. what like, would be? For example... Why is it that you don't, when you're out of the country, why don't you speed? Even down here in South Africa. Hashima, yeah. 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 Or you know, you're in Rwanda. Why don't you do it? Because you, there is a consequence. Mm. What is the consequence for speeding in Kenya? Seeing so, a cop. Yeah. And then? So seeing the cop. Corona. Exactly. Corona so what have we done? We've created a situation whereby there is no consequence to the actions we, we do. Mm. So then everybody likes to point fingers. Oh, it's the police. Oh, it's the NTSA. Oh, it's the... Everybody's pointing fingers at each other. Mm. But who was driving that car? You have your children in your car. You've got your wife in the car. But you want to drive at 200 kilometers an hour. How is that somebody? That is actually a personal decision that you must make. And maybe that's where that's the conversation of how do I start with me mm. before I say Eric needs to do something. It has to be myself. First. So what are speed coming measures? Cameras are excellent. Mm -hmm. Design of roads. There's a way you can design a road that actually reduces how people how people drive. It's a very it's it's done. It's done in very many places. Well, where you require where you require bumps, we also have to standardize those bumps where where it's yeah. supposed to be bumped. It's not one is a hill and one is rubble strips. Mm. Yeah, some rubble strips work very well, others don't. But we ours is a mishmash. There's no clear. Um, there's no clear. Uh, everybody does their own thing, mm. and a lot of you will see when an accident happens, say that attacker bumps, attacker the bumps. People want to create a small market there, so when the bumps <laughs> come, then we can start selling wares, and that's why you find in every, especially on the main trunk roads, people want bumps because it. When you slow down traffic, I can sell some things, mm. but even that selling of those things on in on the roads is actually a danger. To other people, mm. to the people who are who are on the side of the roads, yeah. the pedestrians. Let's talk about uh, public transport. We call it public transport, but we keep saying on this show that we don't have public transport in this country. The only thing right? public is the passengers. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have. There's been move. Uh, there have been moves by the Ministry of Transport to roll out the BRT. Mm. Started a couple of years ago. They painted the road. That was step number one paint the road and write BRT only. Mm -hmm. And then you get there and you wonder, okay, so BRT buses, where are they? Uh, second stage, construction of some stages on thicker superhighway. Well, I think the first stage was designing the BRT routes. Okay. Third was announcement by the ministry that, you know, we want to encourage bidders who would like to be given the license to operate BRTs within the city. Condition, those buses must be electric or hybrid. Mm. And then now uh, here we are. And we asked ourselves, hey, is the ministry running too fast? Before we get there, you have been in the transport sector for a while. Before you tell us about Basigo, mm. what is this idea of BRT from how you understand it? Okay, I am... <laughs> I'm going to try and be as diplomatic as I can, mm. yeah. Because uh, having served in where I served, mm. I don't want to look like I'm throwing stones at uh, my former colleagues. Mm. However, mm -hmm. BRT is an excellent idea. What is a BRT? It's a way of moving people. You see, we build roads to move cars. BRT is the first time we're actually trying to design something to move people. The expressway is not to move cars; it's to move people. Now, if I can move. A thousand people every every 10 minutes in buses from for example Roiro all the way to the CBD what do I do I'm actually allowing a better uh, opportunity for the people who are using their own vehicles so public transport is an is a good thing and it used to work here some of us went to school when we used to take public transport buses Kenya bus services they were scheduled they were they had timetables you you would you knew if you miss this bus the next one's 15 minutes so that's a good idea mm. and that's the kind of transport we require now that said and done it's not something you flip a switch it must be a, a process that you go through and i think they've been going through that process and it's not easy because when you've had 30 30 years of liberalized transport for the government to start coming back in this time when we are all well uh, there's so many competing interests in terms of 
in terms of budgetary locations, it's difficult. So, and if you look at in where public transport works, it's actually it's, it's actually government run and subsidized by government. Here we are trying to do a hybrid where it's actually privately run with, and regulated by government, and there's something there that it, it's and hence why the difficulty in actually implementing quickly. Mm -hmm. But that said and done, when they for me when they said electric, I thought what a wonderful idea. I, th I thought it's an excellent idea because that is actually the way public transport is going across the world, whether you're talking about trains or buses. And the reason why uh, high capacity buses work is because they move lots of people. One bus with 70 people is is the equivalent of taking out 70 vehicles out of the highway. Yeah. And if there was a, if today there was a, uh, there was um, a scheduled bus service. I would come by bus to this place. But because I cannot guarantee, and I've, many times I've had people come here and they have said they were late because they didn't know where to get off the expressway or there was traffic, it's because it's, it's, we can't actually schedule our transport. Mm. But can Kenyans do it? Yes, they can because SGR taught us. Mm -hmm. The first few days of SGR, <laughs> we used to left. be people who are left. <laughs> but now it's a scheduled service. Does anybody get left? No. Nope. We can learn. Mm. We can learn as Kenyans. So BRT, excellent idea i would say they, they need to give it as much um, push as they can if they can electrify it hallelujah if it can be if they can create a participation so that the current operators in the uh, in the public service uh, public service transport are also included even better your statement however is laden with, laden with a lot of ifs and buts yes uh, why are you saying if they can do this then but this would be the what 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 is it what are your apprehensions over this i live on that road and i see what's going on and mm. um, as as erica said it was a red line first written brt only then it was something else uh, have we bought in the reason why eric is asking that is because we are skeptical mm. we don't believe and maybe we should be piloting and do a, a six months one year pilot so that we can actually show that it, it's possible and we didn't believe the SGR would work, but it works today. Mm -hmm. So that's baby steps. Let's get five buses running every day mm -hmm. and uh, with a booking up and everybody like what they're doing with a, with a train. And slowly let's build to it so that we can learn. Yeah, but sometimes, and then let's sort of design holistically. Because now when you, when you design the road, like for example, the worst road in Kenya, Outer Ring Road, how mm -hmm. are we going to put BRT on Outer Ring Road? That, we should have designed it with that in mind yeah so we have to stop doing this where you build and then you come and have to fix, redo, everything, the, fix everything and uh, ukarabati and we are trying to fix you know square holes uh, round, round peg in square, square hole holes. yeah and then things don't work and then it looks like oh you know expressway doesn't work no it's because how we implemented it and that's why I said at the beginning, we do things like we are the first ones to do them. Mm. They've been done elsewhere and they can be done. Let's just do it properly once. Well, what stops us from piloting? Uh, wrong person to ask that question, I think. <laughs> no, I was, I was actually thinking aloud. Yeah. <laughs> I was actually thinking aloud because uh, the, there was also the, the, uh, the discussion of including people who are already in the transport industry mm. into it. And we did have a conversation with the people in that industry and there was the issue of cost. I didn't believe it for a single second mm. because if, if I look at the Matatu business, they're all in circles. Mm. So it's not as though it's one person doing it. And given the nature of that business and the monopoly that they are, and mm. the near monopoly that they have, it cannot be that they don't have the money. The, 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 that can't be the reason. So I'm actually, again, thinking aloud. So what is stopping us from implementing something that clearly will be beneficial proof of concept that's why we pilot proof of concept you prove the concept works mm. they will all fall in you can become a, a an investor in that uh, area if the concept is proved but again moses are we saying that we lack investors we don't so but why would you invest in something that you that has not been proved that it can work? Mm. Must it work in Kenya for us to understand that it works? I agree, but uh, if you are putting a few of your hundred million dollars in it, then you want to see that it will work in Kenya. That those matatus or those other guys are not going to come and block your bus that runs on a schedule. Sure, because there are many factors I would assume that would affect the process that perhaps do not work in another country. If you want to benchmark on what's happening with in Egypt, for example, do they have the matatu problem? 
thing that we do here do we see uh, roads with design flaws that they have there so in as much as you can say yes it would work in another country i think you would then have to pilot in the country in which you want to implement the thing to see how the different factors playing out would affect the process no you, you don't do yeah we never had an sgr before mm -hmm. we didn't pilot an sgr we had a railway before and it worked but we knew that the rail system works. Why? Because we've seen it work. In Kenya? Yes. Yes. A bus is a bus is a bus. <laughs> no, it's not. Very it's different <laughs> city. No, no the, it's rail, the railway <laughs> is on a dedicated corridor that yes. no one else is using. You're not yes. competing. You're not competing. Yes. Not Maybe yes. house dogs on the road, but, they are, but, <laughs> yes. rail, but not. Yes. Uh, let me repeat. Uh -huh. A bus is a bus is a bus. Uh -huh. Who determines the dedicated passage for that bus? Is it us? No. no. Who owns the roads? Who runs the roads? Who maintains it? See, they're the ones. Yes. Now, who stops them? And they are the government. All I'm saying is, the entire process that we're talking about appears like it's a huge mountain that must be climbed. And I'm saying it is not. Yes. So why is it being made to appear like it's some huge mountain that must be climbed? Well, the day you learn a government, you'll see mountains. Why? <laughs> why? It's half past seven. Kenya's biggest conversation. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. We continue the conversation with Moses Dirito. He's a road safety campaigner, a former director of NTSA, chief revenue officer of Basigo. We are talking about public transport today. What is Basigo? So Basigo is an electric uh, mobility company that's looking to um, revolutionize public transport by um, allowing operators to move from their dirty diesel vehicles to clean, um, affordable electric vehicles. Uh, hey, you've practiced that thing, huh? <laughs> yes. Been, uh, that thing has been rehearsed. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> he's, a, yeah, he's the chief revenue officer. After all, it is World Day. <laughs> so electric buses yeah. in this our Kenya. Yes, in this we have seen people who are converting mm -hmm. diesel into electric. Yeah. Very many vehicles being converted. Mm -hmm. The issue, though, when you hear about, about electric buses, is uh, one: you need to charge these things. Mm -hmm. Where do you charge them? Mm -hmm. Number two: if you operate an electric bus mm -hmm. uh, in the country, where will you be charging it? You know. Na, regular basis all those questions come in i mean so are you selling the buses to others or are you operating the buses we're actually selling the buses to the operators to the circles okay. so they what we are doing is we're trying to simplify that process so we, i sell you the bus eric you run it like you run your normal vehicle mm. but then what i do is i'll get into um pay as you drive uh, contract with you so you pay me um, um 20, 20 bob per kilometer of of running mm. and for that i will charge your bus i will clean your bus i will maintain your bus and everything all those headaches that you're talking about um that come with electric or that are perceived to come with electric i take that away from you so that way what you concentrate on your core business which is running the bus so so essentially you're saying let, let me understand yeah. you you sell the bus yes then in addition you then offer a service yes that's where the 20 bob comes in yes I see. Yeah. And the 20 bob is cleaning the bus, servicing the bus, charging the bus. Charging the bus. That means I have to bring the bus to you to so, charge. So what we are doing right now for the two pilot buses, uh, they, they actually come back to us every day because we still own the buses. Mm -hmm. Though they are being run by independent operators, so City Hopper and East Shuttle are running them on their routes. But as we are, as we are taking orders and for the, uh, for, that new, for the operators who have actually taken orders for their buses now, what we are doing is we are mapping out their routes. So uh, similar to what I'm seeing do doing on her screen mm -hmm. and what we do is then we put the charging stations within your route remember how these matatus operate they are picked up at 5 a.m from a petrol station they run the whole day and maybe around nine o'clock ten o'clock they go back to that petrol station yeah. and what do they they get free parking at the petrol station in exchange for uh, fueling. for fueling mm. so in the same way what we then will do is we will look within that route is there a, a termini that works for that 
transport. Some of them have their own hubs or their own uh, depots, mm -hmm. so we can actually put the charging stations there. But we're also looking differently. We say, can we put them in the petrol station, the area that is secure, that the bus can go back there? Uh, or can we put them in, um, uh, if somebody's got a, a, an open space, that we can actually uh, get a concession to park buses uh, and actually charge them there? So ours is decentralized. We're not looking to put a centralized uh, uh, charging point. So we decentralize to the routes where this mat these buses or matatus are going. What does this charging port involve? Well, uh, because it's, because the bus is uh, it's got a huge battery, it's a 135 kV, uh, kilowatt battery. So we there's a charger itself which uh, is connected to the grid, and so sometimes there's an upgrade from the grid because you can't just you you need three phase power. So the upgrade from uh, Kenya Power, who have been very gracious in um, in accommodating our needs. So they put in the charger, and then the rest is pretty let me tell you an electric vehicle operates the way you operate your phone at the end of the day <coughs> plug it in pick it up in the morning and continue so you know, so there is a process there's a technical process of you, putting in the charger you know, before you yeah. came in here we're discussing that yeah. issue of charging and we're thinking so do you park the bus mm -hmm. at your home and then get an extension cable, cable. No, no. Uh, the, 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 yes the, the. for the bus you cannot do that because of the amount of power unless you've got three phase power and you want to do you can't do that and it's also uh it then takes it away from the most efficient way of operating that bus mm -hmm. so what we are doing is we're not trying to change how uh, the bus operators or the matter two operators uh, work what we want to do is complement what they're doing by them going electric they're actually earning 20 percent more because of the savings they're making and of course next week we don't know where diesel will go and mm. yeah mm. so there's that process but also there's the issue of if we look at this country in this country we've got excess power especially at night mm -hmm. so that is an excellent way of actually mopping up that ex excess power and hopefully uh, as we scale eventually th the benefits will trickle to you and i mm. on our bills because right now we pay for that excess power whether we use Consumed it or not, or not. It's, as long as it's generated it have to use it and then the other thing the power that we actually are using in kenya is 92 percent green so which better country is it to electrify transport than kenya so we're saying it's commercially viable 100 percent um at the same time we're also looking at it being environmentally viable um so is, I mean, there are these buzzwords we use all, this, all the time, the way of the future, I mean, etc., etc. Is it really then? Uh, and then you say that for Matatu operators, for example, it's complementary. Mm -hmm. Would it then be something that futuristically it would be then to remove your 14 seater, your, you know, 32 seater and replace them then with these electric buses? Could the demand on Kenyan roads today for public transport actually be met by these buses? so currently in nairobi the replacement uh, of of diesel buses mm. is roughly a thousand five hundred per year just in nairobi alone so if we were to be able buses to, plus matatus or just buses well we are the calling them buses seaters. you know we we call them the buses, mini buses yeah, the mini buses okay. whether, yeah. they're, whether it's a 25 or 33 or even a 50 seater mm. so even if we were to get uh, look 20% of that market value, it's it's significant and grow it or upon time. So there's no way we are going to replace, like, you know, switch and they're mm. all replaced because a typical Matatu has a lifespan of six to eight, maybe 10 years. So those ones are going to replace. But as we are moving forward, we can actually start using uh, cleaner, cleaner, uh, cleaner transport mm -hmm. and, and maybe stop maybe enriching the Arabs too much and start enriching some Kenyan companies that actually generate power here because mm -hmm. we are sending all our money. We're, we're sending 40% of all our forex or our dollars, or our dollars to, to the Arab world. Mm -hmm. Well, we could actually, even if we just took 10% of that, you're talking about $400 million saved in foreign exchange that could be actually used in generating more green power here. And that will have the effect of actually reducing the cost of transportation for everybody. So it's mm -hmm. actually a win-win uh, situation for, for the country and also for the operators and the passengers. So Basigo has two buses so yes. far. Yeah. Right. What model are these buses? The buses are BYD. BYD is... Uh, 
uh, is the world's largest electric bus manufacturer and one of the world's largest electric vehicle manufacturer out of China. So we've got these two pilot buses. They've been running for the last 100 days. Actually, today is the 100th day. Mm -hmm. We've done over 50,000 kilometers uh, between the two buses, carrying uh, 60,000 passengers. Um, and those are the pilot. As I said, we were talking about proof of concept. What have we done in that 100 days? We've actually proved that you actually... Uh, uh, the the revenue per seat is 20 20 higher mm. than the diesel bus now on the back of that we've been taking orders our orders are now getting to three digits from these circles because mm. we we go we present to them we show them what uh what we are offering and some of them by december you we'll, will have another 15 buses and by early next year those 15 we'll have 17 buses running on our roads mm. next year we intend to uh, locally assemble mm. and hopefully get to a few hundred uh, running in in this. So country. the battery size you said yeah. is about what? One thirty one. It's one hundred and thirty five kilowatts. One hundred and thirty five kilowatts. That's a huge battery. It is a huge battery. How much does it? How long does it take to charge it? And then how much does it cost to charge it? Um, if you are to if you are to charge it from zero, which we you never you you typically never do, mm. it'll take you between three and four hours. Yeah, uh, and that's using a slow charger, so uh, charging at, uh, 30, at uh, 30 hertz. But however, you can do fast charger where you actually charge it in two hours. Mm. However, the, uh, what's more important is it's not so much the time because remember I said we're charging at night. When so the bus, bus is not, parked anyway. When the bus is, uh, bus is parked anyway. Mm. What's important is that uh, that bus can actually do 250 kilometers in a day. Okay. That means it's able to do the entire day uh running and remember these buses are predictable mm. they move from a to b from b to a and that that, that is their cycle that's anyway. their route so it's quite predictable so you what the first thing if you come to me as um as a matatu operator as a circle i say where is your route where do you go and we'll see what how many kilometers do you do are you within the within um the capacity of the bus mm. if you're not so what we've realized is sometimes uh, at lunchtime or off peak the drivers need to take a break mm -hmm. because and during that break we can actually do a top-up charge mm. and you find a bus doing 320 ki kilometers in a day mm. so it works quite it's been working out quite well how much to charge that bus would cost you around a thousand shillings a day Fully charged? Fully charged. And it will take you for how long in terms of kilometers? 250, 250. kilometers. And okay. remember a that... typical Matatu, like now the ones that you have on the road. When... when How uh, long? How many kilometers is a, a bus doing? 250. Most are doing two, between 250 and 300. And it's costing them a thousand shillings? For electric... For just charging. Just charging. Yes. Now, the diesel equivalent, at when diesel was 115, yes. was 6,000 bob. Per day. Per day. So now they're doing maybe seven... Maybe, yeah. Yeah, so, and that's why the pay as you drive works. So mm -hmm. what we are doing is, uh, we are subsidizing the acquisition cost, the upfront cost, because an electric vehicle of any type, whether it's a motorcycle, bicycle, car, bus, m more, normally is two or two and a half times more expensive than its uh, petrol counterpart. Mm -hmm. So what we are saying is, you pay me the same amount that you pay for your diesel bus. But then I will recover. Uh, so I basically am selling you the bus without the battery. I recover that difference by giving you uh, the pay as you drive subscription over the period, over the over the life of the bus. Yeah, or the, uh, that way you are, we can we can uh, guarantee your warranty of the battery because everybody. What's the biggest worry? Say, so what if the battery dies? Yeah. If the battery dies, I will replace it because it's on warranty, and because I see the bus every day on the point of charging, I am able to know how you're using it. I am able to share that information with you. If your driver is um, is basically misbehaving, I'll tell you, yeah, your this driver is not driving as as it should. And so there's a bit of training to do that. And there's uh, conversations to be had with uh, these operators. But so far, so good. Mm -hmm. yeah. In terms of maintenance of these vehicles, I mean, every time, you know, you got to, something happens, you need to take the car to the shop, etc. What is then locally available or is that not an issue? Actually, um, the, the the electric mechanic comes with an uh, with an iPad or a or a tablet, mm. because this story of spanner oils, the oil filter, mm. clutch, those those that's that's in the past. So, uh, the moment I put in the charging gun, the first thing it the, the, it goes through is a diagnosis of the entire bus. Mm. It'll show you is is there anything wrong with the bus, and then if there's nothing wrong with the bus, it'll tell you. 
ready to charge and you charge. But if something goes wrong, in the 100 days that we've been running these two buses, we've had one day of downtime. Mm. Yeah. For one, one day. Bus. Or yeah. for both buses? For one, I mean, combined for okay. both buses. One day of downtime. And our, uh, our tech team was there to be able to fix that bus quite quickly because unlike uh, unlike your our counterparts in diesel there is no you know guy opening sg filters <laughs> repulling mm. diesel with a car pipe those things don't exist <laughs> we've got to, we've got like um, we've got like how many moving parts you've got a motor and a battery to worry about that's it mm. yeah these guys have i don't know how many parts something so, that i've wondered about moses <laughs> mm. There was a time when I was a, a child. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> that was, was an actual <laughs> thing. Oh, yes, yeah. there was a time. Okay. And bicycles had headlamps. Mm -hmm. But they also had a dynamo. Dynam Thank dynam you very much. <laughs> I think you know where I'm going with this one here. All right. So why don't you just answer the question? <laughs> so yes, the buses do have regenerative charging. Yes. As you're going downhill, as you're posting, the moment you they, they do they do have regenerating charging, and you yeah. can get ten percent back mm. through regenerative charging. Mm. Now, what does that do? It mm. saves you on brakes. Mm. It's a bit like um, what Kenyans like to call freno, um, mm. engine brakes. <laughs> yeah, that. But that now <laughs> I've never understood that. Yeah, yeah. It's basically what you're doing is you're plugging the exhaust and forcing the engine to slow down. No, uh, yes. Now for an electric Electric, the moment you release you you have that dynamo effect and it actually recharges the battery and that's uh, that's that's the beauty of electric uh, yes. technology i was going to take it to the second yes. level of the discussion <laughs> now with the modern petrol vehicles yes. we have an alternator yes. mm. okay yeah. it does more or less that same thing mm -hmm. rech recharging this particular battery as it goes uh, as, yes it, yes <laughs> now <laughs> is it possible or does technology exist where you can actually drive mm. and in the course of the day perhaps with a little top up mm. the battery actually continues getting charged so instead of 250 kilometers you can do 500 kilometers um technology is working on that it's not yet enough to be able to self-charge or self-propel but there's of course there's a lot of uh, boffins out there who are actually looking at that but yes you do recover maybe 10 percent of energy and I think uh, for those who watch Formula One, you hear them saying that they're harvesting energy mm -hmm. as they're braking. Mm -hmm. That is actually the technology that then moves to, to our vehicles, to our buses. And that's why it's so exciting. So that we, we create the next, the next level of jobs. Let's, mm -hmm. It would not be grog on spanners. It would be a guy on, uh, on, on a phone and he comes and he, he checks and he'll be able to tell you that cell number 300 of the batteries, the one wrong, and we isolate that and the, and the vehicle goes. And that's a whole new industry. I see it as a point where 25 years ago when cell phones came, there were no cell phone mechanics or technicians. But today you can get your phone fixed because necessity is a mother of invention. So mm. once we embrace this new technology, we've got young people who are tech savvy. Who I mean, we trained our guys online during the pandemic. Mm. So they were, they were doing uh, classes with uh, OEM from China and they were being trained. They didn't have to go. So we, life is changing and we have to change with it. And I'm so excited and I give a shout out to all these Matatu guys who have actually put their money where their mouth is and signed uh, to acquire these buses because we've always seen uh, public transport or Matatu guys as backward. These guys are, some of them are really tech savvy and they're looking at uh, different things and looking mm. to move forward. Mm. Yeah. You know, the government asked uh, bidders mm -hmm. to apply to be allowed to operate BRT. Yeah. You've been in this for 100 days. Mm -hmm. Looking at it, is it feasible for a company to actually come in and operate the 100 buses that are required to mm -hmm. actualize BRT? In fact, from that bid, they said that what they require to run that one route of BRT is 300 buses. Mm -hmm. It is very feasible. It is, it is actually, it's very possible. Uh, is the investment huge? Most definitely, uh, do you require some government incentives and government to do some heavy lifting to be able to make sure that that happens? Most definitely. Is there going to be conflict? Most definitely. But it's possible because there's nothing in the world that's not important. It is very possible. We just need to have the political will mm. and to actually uh, put our money where our mouth is and it will happen. And so for us, instead of waiting for that process to happen, let us go to the guys who are actually already doing it. These are the guys who carry 80% of all Nairobians. 
So let's give them that benefit now. And when the government comes on board and we get incentives for electric vehicles, it will only get better for the guys who have actually uh, invested in it. Yeah. Should the government get into this business, invest, at least even in the, file, in the pilot phase? Because you're saying it's expensive. It's expensive to have an electric bus on the road. You're asking people to bring in 300 buses. Yeah. I, think, um, I think government has, uh, has a lot of uh, com com uh, competing interests. Now, is public transport something that is supposed to be in, uh, in government? As I said, it's a social service. Should it be done by government? Most definitely. Can it be done after 40 years of liberalization? I'm not sure. So what I would say is uh, government needs to continue creating the atmosphere, regulating better so that the ones who are operating can actually then work better. Because I think that bus has, uh, that bus has left your bus imenda. Yeah. So government, you don't see government coming back. Public transport in this country is history. I, I, I would, I want to imagine or I would love to hope that it's possible, but I don't see it. What I would rather they did is create that environment so that those, I mean, there are circles here in Nairobi that are 400 vehicles mm. today. Those are the guys who should be molded in a way or given the incentive to actually run that public transport in a better way and give them even um they should be subsidized mm. so if you want the fare i mean if you want the fare to be 20 bob let them charge 20 bob but the government puts something in and those mm. guys will uh, will see the will see the the need to operate that but way. see there's the other side of the coin yeah if we go with that uh, mentality then it means that the government will be seen as a competitor if it ever came up with light rail system, with improving the uh, Nairobi commuter rail system. It will be seen like government is coming to compete with these private business people. I really don't think it's competition. Look at how this city is growing. We actually are maybe 20 years behind what we require in public transport. So the light rail, should it's an integrated system. I should be able to get into the train, get out here, but how do I get to that last mile? Mm. Or how do I get to the next mile? Because how do I get to a train to Westlands? Okay, so I'll take the, the light rail to the town, but I need connectivity from that point to, to the next destination. So that is what government should be doing. And then creating a way that... Um, that public service transport companies can then now do that, but in a better way than we are doing it. Now, how we are doing it today uh, creates chaos and creates all this congestion. That's why your top favorite pet project, Green Park. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you know, again, that's proof of concept. I like what they are doing, but they must. You can't. The start stop doesn't work. Let's 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 not say all everybody comes in. Let's take one route. Uh, Same uh, number one eleven. Today yeah, number one eleven. All of them come to Green Park. Let's then slowly. That's why we started two buses, not a hundred. And that's why I'm very confident confident that in December I can add another fifteen because then I will f the infrastructure to run those fifteen will be there. Now from that key I can then make the big the next step to a hundred. Yeah, because I've taken baby steps and I'm learning. Um, I'm also now moving with my utility, with mm. the Kenya powers of the world, that they are now understanding what my needs are and what, what I'm doing. So that that way I'm not doing everything at once. And then we end up with where our conversation started. Mm. We're saying we behave like we're the first ones to do something in the world. You know, Moses, <laughs> thank you for coming. You, you are a serial entrepreneur. This is a man who started introducing those mobile toilets that we see. <laughs> right? <laughs> Exclusive is man. <laughs> uh, cheap, affordable housing, cotto housing, this man. <laughs> okay. And have all those things worked? You tell us. They have. Of course. Okay. They have. The so why would this is one work? Culture. It's <laughs> now everybody ex expects if you have an event, you must have some toilet yes. somewhere on the side. And it's now become normal. They have worked. And electric, electric vehicles will be normal within the next three to five years. Okay. We believe you. Thank you very much for joining us. Moses Nderito is the Chief Revenue Officer for Basigo. If we see those buses, can we tell that this is the electric bus? Yes, you can. Uh, how does because it you'll see it, you yeah. won't hear it. Mm. All right. And, they, are, and, and they, they look like a bus out of Europe. That's where they the don't look is. like a... So the border guys can't tell there's a bus yeah, behind No, them. when they're stopping, there's a small alarm. When yeah. they're coming into the bus stop, there's a small alarm that beeps so that you can hear it. Otherwise, you can't hear it. It just glides. <laughs> Just like that, the way he did it. Just like that. <laughs>
Moses, we're also very big as we head into this election, and I know you're very passionate about uh, governance and all on matters of <laughs> elections, Bill and Norman. <laughs> yeah. Making sure that your neighbor looks at you as a neighbor and does not look at you as a political competitor. And this is what we've been saying. We are doing elections, Bill and Norman campaign. Go and preach the word of peace to your friends and colleagues and neighbors and your uh, fellows at Basigo. Right? Will do. Thank you, guys.